And my practice, just to give you kind of a 30,000 foot view, is in Ocala, Florida, about an hour north of Orlando, if anyone ever wants to swing by. And we focus really on three specific niches. Number one is personal injury. Number two is neuropathy, and that's what I lectured on last year at homecoming. And then number three is what I'm excited to share with you tonight, which is knee pain. And so really when it comes to niche marketing, these are the kind of boulders, if you will, that make up the foundation of my practice. PI, neuropathy, knee pain. Regular chiropractic patients, uh, referrals from medical doctors for people with neck pain, back pain, things like that. That's kind of what fills in the cracks in my practice. And so we'll see a typical month for us will be about 120 to 150 new patients a month. And of that, perhaps about 30 to 50 of those will be uh, neuropathy patients. About 30 to 50 will be knee pain patients. Uh, we'll see anywhere from you know, probably 20 to 35 PI patients. And the remainder will be regular chiropractic patients, neck pain, back pain. A lot of that's word of mouth from existing patients, uh, medical offices, things like that. So when you talk about the knee pain niche, there is a massive amount of opportunity in the chronic knee pain space. And this picture, I should have probably given you a warning uh, when I do live seminars and I show this picture uh, to the folks in the audience, I kind of give them a heads up, but you know, we're doctors here, so hopefully a little bit of blood and guts doesn't freak you out too much. But this picture is why there is massive opportunity in the knee pain space. Because right now, patients are seeing the kind of pathway of start with medication. And 10 years ago, I was telling Dr. Bremhall that, believe it or not, I have been in practice 10 years. Some of you that have met me uh, might not believe that. But uh, 10 years ago, I used to really have to spend a lot more time educating our patients on the dangers of popping Advil and Tylenol and these NSAIDs, you know, like Tic Tacs. Now, people are already nodding their heads when I start to bring it up because their doctors have begun to more and more educate them. It's not healthy to take that all the time. And then when we talk about pain meds, the average patient is scared silly of getting addicted to things like Oxycontin, Percocet, your opioid pain medications. I read a statistic the other day that blew my mind. 75% of the new heroin users that uh, are coming into the United States, 75% of the heroin users in the U.S., started with prescription pain medication. And I use that stat with patients because people need to understand. And then of course the cortisone shots, which patients know are just a temporary patch. They know that's you know, not a long-term solution. And furthermore, we educate them on the fact that that's actually deteriorating and eroding the joints when they get repetitive cortisone shots to then of course knee replacement surgery. That's the pathway that we see most orthopedic surgeons uh, kind of going down with people. And that's not a pathway that the average patient is satisfied with. The patients you're looking for are the folks that they have goals. They want to get back on the golf course. They want to be able to uh, go walking with their spouse. They've got grandkids coming to Disney and they want to be able to get on the rides with them. These patients are not satisfied with pills to cortisone shots to surgery, they want something better, they're demanding something better, and the orthopedic community for the most part is not filling that niche. And when they are filling it, they're filling it with things that are kind of scary to the average patient. Stem cell injections, PRP injections, amniotic uh, injections, those are all really cool and really good treatments, but that's something that the average patient, the idea of having a chunk of bone marrow taken out of their hip and injected in their knee, that's still a little scary. So if we can present something that's effective, that's non-invasive, and gets the job done and gets them back to what they want to do, that's really where uh, the opportunities lie. Now understand there are 10,000 people a day in the United States that are turning 65. So if you, you're concerned, oh, there's a shortage of patients, or I'm going to run out of people to market to, that's just probably not the case. 10,000 people a day that are turning 65. My typical knee pain patient, usually someone going to be in their mid-60s to late 70s. We do have people much older than that. The challenge with them is they sometimes kind of have a fatalistic, well, I'm 85 years old, you know, how good can I really feel type of attitude. 
uh, but it's fun when you get results with them. And then we do see some folks in their 40s and 50s, uh, usually people that had a uh, meniscus tear and surgery didn't fix it, or kind of your weekend warriors that don't want to get arthroscopic surgery. But really the sweet spot for what I treat is that 65 to 78 type of a demographic, and there's no shortage of those people in the United States. Now the big thing that I want to talk about, and this is something that I want you guys to really grab hold of and own with your patients, is what actually causes osteoarthritis of the knee. Because when we talk about arthritis, I'm not referring to rheumatoid arthritis and um, not referring to all the different you know, psoriatic arthritis and things like that. We're really talking about OA. And so the average patient, they really don't have any clue what causes arthritis. The doctor never explained it, and quite frankly, I don't think most doctors really think too much about it because it seems so self-evident. Well, it's just, it's a, osteoarthritis is just a, a wear and tear condition of the joint. And we kind of act like people have, you know, just sort of worn out their joints. It's like they outlived their warranty. But if you get these people thinking a little bit, I'll say, well, Mrs. Jones, let me ask you this. Uh, your left knee, you've come here with, with a lot of pain, but your right knee, you said, feels okay. Is that correct? Well, that's right. And so I'll laugh and say, well, you think you're old in your left knee and young in your right knee? And you kind of watch the light bulb go on. Or we'll show them a picture like this, and I'll say, well, this is bone on bone over here. This, you do still have some joint space, although there is some arthritis here. Do you think this is the old side of your knee and this is the young side of your knee? Because in a normal healthy knee, they should be about the same on both sides. And again, you watch the light bulbs come on. We also uh, have patients who they uh, they kind of take a very you know s a very self uh, blaming guilty type of attitude because they say well doctor says it's because of my weight now are there patients who main cause of their knee pain is they're overweight absolutely but I get people telling me this that are like 20 30 pounds overweight we're not talking about someone that's 500 pounds morbidly obese and so. Those patients love me because I'll tell them, you know what, it's always good to get at a healthy optimal weight. There's a lot of reasons that's, that's healthy for a lot of conditions. But understand when it comes to knee pain, um, I see patients in my office that are four or 500 pounds and their knees feel fine. And I see folks that are 80 pounds soaking wet and their knees are killing them. You probably know people like that. So it's not quite as simple for us as doctors to just point the finger at you, Mrs. Jones, and to blame it on that. And that kind of takes the weight off their shoulders and it automatically builds rapport with them because they see you as a safe, friendly space. You're, you're not a doctor who uh, is going to kind of pile on the bandwagon of blaming them. Well, it's your own fault. You just need to, need to lose weight and your knees wouldn't hurt because then it's a real kick in the teeth for those folks when they, some of them do lose the weight and their knees typically still hurt. So what really causes this? And this was something that I had a light bulb turned on by me, uh, turned on to me a couple of years ago by a fellow named Dr. Andy Barlow. Some of you have heard uh, Dr. Barlow speak. Um, you've heard of his group, AFNI, the American Functional Neurology Institute. If you're looking to get involved in the kind of functional neurology world and want something that's practical and usable, I cannot recommend his uh, group enough. He was the one that initially uh, kind of explained this concept of knee pain to me that I'm going to share with you. So I want to give him uh, credit where credit is due. My then contribution was taking the communication, the report of findings, the marketing. That's what I do well, new patient marketing and patient communication. But the clinical side of things, Dr. Barlow, I'm definitely indebted to in teaching this concept to me. So it's not a wear and tear. They just wore out. That is the case in some situations. You get someone who laid tile for 40 years. Well, no wonder their knees hurt. But in most cases, it's a little more complicated than that. I would propose that one of the more significant causes of uh, chronic knee pain and arthritis actually relates to dysfunction of the stabilizing muscles of the knee. So let me show you what I mean. Uh, this is a study from the journal Osteoarthritis and Cartilage and this showed proprioception and knee arthritis. And they said that several authors have suggested that impaired proprioceptive accuracy reduces knee protection during walking, thereby possibly causing degenerative damage of the knee joint. 
proprioceptive accuracy of the knee seems to be impaired in knee osteoarthritis patients. Eleven studies showed a significant impairment in position sense or motion sense in a total of 387 knee OA patients when compared to age-matched healthy controls. So they're comparing them to people that are their same age but don't have osteoarthritis of the knee. Muscle weakness or atrophy may decrease muscle spindle sensitivity, thereby possibly impairing proprioceptive accuracy. Interesting. So proprioception is something we need to be thinking about. And the cool thing, uh, many of the doctors on this call, probably most of you are chiropractors. I know Dr. Brimhall has a broad audience in functional medicine and some folks from other disciplines, but for most of you who are probably chiropractors, this is something that you're going, okay, this is your talk in my language. This is stuff that uh, makes sense to me. And this is another interesting article from the journal Arthritis Care and Research. And this was association of lower muscle strength with self-reported knee instability in OA of the knee, uh, the results from the Amsterdam Arthritis Cohort. Self-reported knee instability. This is patients that will tell you, boy, doc, my knee feels weak. It feels like it gives out. Uh, 67% who was present of the OA patients and mainly occurred during walking. Lower muscle strength was significantly associated with the presence of self-reported knee instability. So if their knee muscles were less strong, they were much more likely to feel like their knee was giving out on them. Quadriceps weakness and osteoarthritis of the knee. This is a fairly old article from Annals of Internal Medicine. The data are consistent with the possibility that quadriceps weakness is a primary risk factor for knee pain, disability, and progression of joint damage in persons with osteoarthritis of the knee. Uh, this is another one from uh, the journal Arthritis Care and Research, uh, reports of joint instability, and they said a substantial proportion of individuals with knee OA report episodes of knee instability during activities of daily living, and instability affects physical function, and this is interesting, beyond which that can be explained by contributions from other impairments such as knee pain, range of motion, and quadriceps strength. So what that means is these people have problems with their ADLs that we can't say, oh, well, you know, they have, they have that issue just because the knee hurts or because the range of motion is crummy or their quadriceps are weak. It, it actually goes beyond that um, with these folks that have instability. So what I would um, put out there for a theory to you to think about is lumbar spinal stenosis. When you as a chiropractor start thinking about dysfunction of the nervous system in the lower extremities, you ought to be thinking about spinal stenosis in the lumbar spine. Now it's interesting because when these patients come to your office, uh, many of them are going to be complaining of back pain. And so when you start talking about the relationship between their low back and their knees, the first thing they're going to say is, well doc, uh, let me stop you right there, my low back feels great. Some of them will say that. Some of them will go, oh, I forgot to tell you my back's killing me too. Or, oh, by the way, my back doesn't hurt, but I had a three-level fusion two years ago. Or, oh, I got lots of arthritis in my back and degenerative discs, and, but my knees are really what hurts. So here's how I explain it to patients. I say, well, so kind of like the alignment in your car. So if you have one tire that is constantly wearing out unevenly, you can patch that tire, which Mrs. Jones is like getting a cortisone shot, and you can even replace that tire. This is Dr. Brimhall's car, by the way, if anyone's wondering. Uh, you can even replace that tire, which is like getting a knee replacement surgery. But what happens to that tire if you don't fix the alignment? That's right. It keeps wearing out over and over and over. Now, in the case of your knees, Mrs. Jones, the uh, knee is a little more complicated than a car, but the alignment or the stability of your knees is maintained by the muscles that surround and support and protect that knee. And those muscles are fed by nerves. And can we guess where those nerves come from? That's right, they come from your low back. If we have a condition called spinal stenosis, degenerative disc disease, where we have some irritation or some compression on those nerves, well, those nerves aren't feeding good signals to the muscles, the muscles don't do their job, and so guess where the pressure gets put? That's right, on those joints. And it often happens unevenly, that's why uh, in the case of your x-rays we could see that the inside portion of your knee was much more thinned out than the outside portion of the knee. And so understand, Mrs. Jones, when I talk about this condition of pinched nerves in the back, you may immediately be thinking, oh, but pinched nerves, I don't have any pain in my back or my leg or things like that, but understand there are two types of nerves very broadly in our body. There's nerves that cause pain 
And then there's those are called sensory nerves, and then there's nerves that control the muscles. We call those motor or muscle nerves. And so if we have uh, some compression or some irritation or dysfunction on the motor nerve, well, you don't necessarily feel any pain. You may not have pain at all, but this is where this dysfunction is coming from. So we call that, Mrs. Jones, a neurologic knee issue. And this is why the uh, Tylenol, this is why the cortisone shots, this is why uh, even the knee surgery your doctor's recommending potentially isn't really getting to the root cause of this problem. So what we've got to do first is to determine if you have what we call a neurologic knee issue. And by the way, that's a term, doctors, that I made up, so you can feel free to make up whatever term you like. But to me, what we just showed with the effects of proprioception on stability um, and so on and so forth, that makes a lot of sense. And for me, that was like a light bulb that went on uh, when it came to understanding knee pain and knee arthritis. And for a lot of patients, you watch the light bulb come on as well. Now, when these people come in, beyond the consultation, the first step is your examination. So what we teach in my Knee Pain Elite program is you do the typical orthopedic exam we all learned in school, all those tests like McMurray's and anterior posterior drawer, and the stuff we do that's honestly, unless you're a sports doc and you're on the field with athletes, it's really never positive other than you know some of the meniscus findings. You do that stuff, but what you're going to do that really is going to knock their socks off is what we call a functional neurologic exam. I call this my knee pain severity exam. And so what I explain to the patients is that, Mrs. Jones, we're going to do some very simple and non-invasive testing that's going to help us understand how well or not well those nerve signals from your lower back are communicating with your knees and communicating with your legs to keep the alignment where it should be. And so this is a really neat exam. We're essentially measuring the large diameter afferents, and it doesn't take, you know, but about five to eight minutes to do once you're really uh, proficient and very comfortable with it. And it has a wow factor for patients that just knocks their socks off because you're the first person who, you know, is testing their joint position uh, proprioceptive ability. You're testing vibration, helping them you know, feel how, how well they can feel vibration in their thumbs, but then when you put a tuning fork on their big toe, it feels like it's half as much. And so in the system, we walk through, we actually have uh, Dr. Brady Wyrick, who's one of the lecturers with American Functional Neurology Institute. He goes through and performs the neurologic exam so you can replicate it and you can do this in your office. So again, you're elevating yourselves beyond the uh, family doctor who didn't do much of anything, even the ortho who did uh, wants to do surgery. He has immediate kind of social proof and uh, credibility over you However, you're the one that's really digging to the root cause of the problem, and this is how you can position yourself as a more credible alternative and a more credible source, even than an orthopedic doctor, which, quite frankly, is you know pretty awesome. So that's the exam that we do, uh, the ortho exam, the neuro exam, and then, of course, we bring them back for day two and uh, do the report of findings with these folks. Now, treatment regimen. What are we actually doing with these patients? Because let me first say here, there are dozens of different things that you can do in the kind of conservative arena that are very, very beneficial and very helpful for the treatment of chronic knee pain. So there's no kind of one secret sauce, but what I'm going to share with you are some of the different tools that you can use and incorporate. And what I love about Dr. Brimhall's group is you guys are like me. You love your gadgets and you love your toys. So a lot of you probably already have this stuff in your office. And some of you have this stuff in your office that you're thinking about hawking on, uh, on eBay or Cairo Planet as the end of the year is coming for tax purposes and for Christmas presents. And I don't want that. And as much as I like a good bargain on used equipment, I want you all to get this stuff out, put it in your office, use it, help people, make money, save lives. Because at the end of the day, um, what you're doing is you are either uh, convincing someone that you have the solution and getting them started in your office, or the orthopedic doctor is convincing them they need a knee replacement. And are there times where knee replacements are necessary? Of course. But are they way too far overdone? In my opinion, absolutely. Uh, I think of a uh, patient very vividly who attended one of my knee pain seminars. We'll talk about how I use patient seminar marketing. Uh, 
and he attended one of my knee pain seminars and he'd already had a knee replacement and uh, he developed some nerve damage in uh, one of his legs and his foot as a result of the knee replacement. So now his knee still hurts. He is now in a walker because of the nerve damage and he now has this lower extremity neuropathy that developed secondary to the surgery. And I remember it like it was yesterday, this just I'm probably 85 years old and this, this poor sweet old man who looked at me as honestly and as plain as the day is long and he said, but Dr. Walker, this surgery was supposed to fix my problem. And it just, you could tell that the years and years of institutional trust that had been built up in the medical paradigm, this poor man was just kind of watching it crumble. It's like he could not believe that his medical heroes, the you know, surgeon in the white coat, had essentially ruined his life and butchered his knee. <clears throat> and here's the sad thing, and this is why I share this story with you. This is not one where I can say, and then I fixed him and saved him, and he you know, plays in the golf tournament with his country club every year. Uh, after about half a dozen visits in our office, uh, Mr. So-and-so took a fall and uh, had to discontinue treatment because he now had to go and do an inpatient, uh, in-house rehab type of setting uh, because he had fallen. And so I wish I could leave you with a happy story, but had I seen this patient before he'd had his knee surgery, we would probably be in a whole different ball game. So doctors, when it comes to your marketing, when it comes to your advertising, some of you might be of the mindset that, well, no, that's, I don't need to advertise. I see all the patients I need word of mouth. You think that the quote unquote advertising doctors are doing something wrong or they're doing something that's um, kind of sketchy or you have, you have a negative headspace about advertising. I got news for you. Those doctors likely are helping a lot more people in their office than you are. And it doesn't mean that you know, this is a game and the winner is the one that sees the most patients or makes the most money. But at the end of the day, I think we can all agree, we'd rather be helping a lot more people, forget even the financial outcome, but just for the sake of humanity, than helping less. And I know for a fact that there are some doctors on this webinar that are amazing healers, far surpass what, what I can do and what I achieve in my office and the knowledge that I have. But there's some of you that are amazing healers that are sitting around twiddling your thumbs because you don't have enough patients to treat and you're not impacting your community at the level that, at which you should. So that's my public service announcement for the day. Um, guys like Dr. Liebman that, uh, that Dr. Brimhall mentioned, you need to get to know these guys at homecoming um, because these are people who are in the trenches and you know Jesse's one of those guys who you tell very quickly when you meet him that, yeah, he's doing well. Yeah, I'm sure he's, he's you know, very financially successful. I am friends with him and know him, and so I know his numbers. But he's a guy who does it because he loves people and, and loves to serve and help people, and to me that's pretty cool. All right, so what do you do with these folks? Well, first we've got to address this neurologic component. Now, I really like with these patients doing a flexion distraction type adjustments with them. Uh, I also like, in some cases, doing lumbar decompression. Now, be very careful for a couple reasons. One, you do not want to stir up a low back pain if they're not having low back problems. So if you do decompression, go lighter than you think you might need to with a typical patient because you're looking more for neurologic stimulation than you are trying to suck a herniated disc back into place. Uh, if you're doing adjusting, go easy with these people uh, for two reasons. One, because you don't want to stir up a problem with an adjustment that they didn't have when they came to you. And two, you don't want to confuse them because they already had a chiropractor do that and they don't see how what you do is unique or distinct or different. And so that's why I like flexion distraction. We actually explain it to patients as this is what we call manual decompression. This is a hands-on decompression of those nerves and of those discs. So that's the first thing you need to do and the patient needs to understand this is how we're going to get nerve signal uh, freeing more, flowing more freely to feed and nourish those muscles. Because Mrs. Jones, if we don't do that, trying to fix your knee, it's kind of like trying to bail out a boat while someone's poking holes in the side of it. And this is why you told me you went to physical therapy and they had you sit on a bench and kick a weight machine up and down. This is why it didn't get the results you were looking for because we didn't address the neurologic component here. Now we will also use uh, laser. Now, cold laser, class four laser, 
Dr. Brimhall and many guys he associates with are far more brilliant than I am when it comes to which one to use, what brand, protocols, etc. Here's what I can tell you. My personal experience has been with a condition like uh, arthritic knees, using a class 4 laser in the deeper penetration, in my humble opinion, in my clinical experience, because we have tested side by side, class 4, if you can swing it, is the way to go. So that's my opinion, worth which paid for it, um, but something worth considering. So laser, very, very powerful, very well studied for knee pain. We use a product that will kind of pair with the laser called infrared heat wraps. And this is a product called Earthwrap Mini. And I explained to the patient that the purpose of this is very simple. It's to open up more circulation and blood flow to feed and nourish those knees. The laser, one of the things we know that laser does is it can help to stimulate the regeneration of new cartilage. Now I'm clear with patients. I say, now Mrs. Jones, this doesn't mean we can make your knee look 25 years old again and have you run in the Boston Marathon. I'm not interested in whether your knee can win a beauty pageant. What I'm interested in is getting you back on uh, that horse again or getting you back um, you know, on the tennis court again or whatever it is their, their goal was. And so what this does, this works in conjunction with the laser, and this gets more blood feeding and circulating into that joint. Because when we get more blood, guess what that laser can do? It works more effectively to help regenerate that smooth cartilage, that hyaline cartilage that coats the end of that joint. I also love, 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 love PEMF on my knee pain patients. Now, there's a lot of PEMF devices out there. Uh, Beamer is one that I have in my office, and I know a lot of you have as well. <clears throat> and it is remarkably effective, not just for nerve conditions like neuropathy, but also for uh, more orthopedic musculoskeletal conditions. Now, let me share kind of a cool story with you. About two weeks ago, I had a patient came in who was a retired nurse. And retired nurses tend to be, and you guys have all seen this, your best patients or your worst patients. And she was actually kind of both, because on her report of findings visit, she looked at me and said, you know, I'm so impressed with this office. I, you know, I've already given your name to three of my friends, and I just I thanked her profusely. But then when it came to her knee pain program and the things that were cash, because this is, as we'll talk about, our, these are cash services, and, of course, in her mind, if Medicare doesn't pay for it, it must not be legit. And in those patients, I'll say things sometimes like, well, Mrs. Jones, you know, Medicare with what they call their standard of care, which is the fancy way of saying what they pay for, they're not adding and expanding to cover new and cutting edge technology each year. They're covering less and less and less. So whether Medicare covers something or not, isn't a real good marker of whether it's accepted or not. I, for example, the hearing aids, Medicare doesn't pay a nickel for that. And I don't think anyone would say that hearing aids are some kind of quackery or the dentist. Medicare doesn't pay a nickel for dental work, yet certainly we all agree that what dentists do is very important and very scientifically valid. So sometimes you have to kind of reframe to people this whole concept. Um, so in any case, PEMF, she asked me and she said, well, you know, I just have to tell you, Dr. Walker, I, I did some research on this and I was on the computer and, and I couldn't find any studies after 2004. And privately, I kind of laughed because most of the PEMF research that's come out has been since 2004. And I don't know where she was. And I asked her, I said, well, are you familiar with the National Library of Medicine's website, PubMed? And she kind of acted like she was, but I could tell she wasn't. And I said, well, let me, I'll pull up a few articles and, and I'll print some out for you. Now, a patient like that, you know, we all know that's, that's rarely going to move the needle. Um, some patients, when they do that, I'll actually tell them, now, Mrs. Jones, if I take the time to go through and pull these articles for you, and if these articles show that, um, that this really is legit, at that point, will you be convinced that this is something you want to do and want to invest in? Because if not, I understand and I appreciate it. It won't hurt my feelings, but it'll save us a lot of time because I've got three kids at home and a busy schedule. Um, but I'll be more than happy to pull this stuff up if that's what it's going to take for you to feel comfortable with your decision. And then sometimes you can get them to admit, ah, Doc, it's just about the money. That's, you know, let's be honest here. So anyway, so with her, I pulled them up, and I catch her in the hallway the next day, and uh, I said, Mrs. So-and-so, I, I, I uh, want to say thank you to you. And she's sort of taken aback. She's like, what do you mean? And I said, I, it's been probably a good 6 to 12 months since I've been on that PubMed site I told you about and checking into the new research, and boy, I was pretty excited. There is some new stuff that has just come out there that is 
absolutely mind blowing. So thank you, thank you, thank you, um, because it was really exciting for me to read some of this new research. So I challenge you all to go to PubMed and type in just PEMF knee pain or PEMF pain, uh, different conditions, and you'll see there is huge amounts of research coming out right now. Uh, there's one that showed PEMF accelerates the growth rate of chondrocytes, of cartilage cells. And so you can make these claims to patients about what you're doing with the healing. Patients love it. They love the idea of regeneration and regenerative medicine and this is like Star Trek type of stuff to them, but it's legit. You're not making claims that you can't support. So PEMF is a tool that I love with the knee pain patients. Um, another device that we'll use that generates kind of a very low field PEMF, and this is a nice home treatment for these patients, is a device called the Rebuilder. Many of you know about the Rebuilder if you've gone through my neuropathy program, but the Rebuilder, in addition to having these uh, you know, typical sticky pads like you use with a stem device, has conductive knee straps that you can use. And you put one above the knee, below the knee, and it generates a field that goes right across the knee. So the Rebuilder, I could do a whole webinar just on that. This is 180 degrees different than a TENS unit. A TENS unit's designed for kind of numbing and fatiguing the pain nerves. This is designed for actually regenerating and waking up new nerves. So makes sense that if this is a neurologic knee problem, that we're going to get a lot of benefit with that type of stimulation. All right, so I want to take just a quick second here and while we are focused on the clinical stuff, before we switch gears into marketing here, let's take some time for a couple of questions on the clinical side of what we talked about. And again, remember doctors, I did not present or don't want to, to be uh, for you to think that I presented an exhaustive strategy or exhaustive list of everything you could possibly use to treat knee pain. So, you know, you can ask, well, what about this? What about that? But I want to take uh, any clinical questions, if any, that doctors may have. So let me, let me pause for just a second and uh, Aaron, if there's anyone that uh, calls in, if you have questions, you can type them at the bottom of the screen there and you'll see there in your chat box. Or if you're hooked in to be able to ask questions live, you can do that. But I think typing them in for most people typically is the easier way to do things. So we have any clinical questions before I jump into marketing? Or are you guys just so hungry for uh, marketing strategies that yeah, 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 we believe you on the clinical stuff. Yeah, I don't see any questions so far. Okay. Do you want to give them right. a minute or so? Okay, yeah, we'll give you just a minute. Okay, let's see what we have. Uh, do you take x-rays of the knees? Great question. So I guess that was, I, uh, I, I kind of left that part out. Um, so we actually do something a little bit different because I have the technology in my office. We do a DMX or a digital motion x-ray study <clears throat> of their knees. And so what we do is I have a little um, kind of balance platform that we bought and we put a wobble board on it. And so we have them, they put one foot, they're standing on the ground, one foot is on a little rocker board and we have them rock their knees, you know, rock one knee at a time back and forth and back and forth. If I didn't have that, I'm actually in the process of opening a satellite office right now that probably is not going to have that, that tool, um, then absolutely yes, I would make sure I took uh, films of the knees, and if you have any kind of findings that indicate to you that there is lumbar involvement, which you're going to find in a significant majority of cases, then I would also recommend x-rays of the lower back. Reason is that helps to demonstrate to people, because we know a large percentage of them are going to have compression or thinning of the discs and things like that and it just kind of helps drive the point home to the patient of this lumbar involvement with their knee issue. So yes, knee x-rays absolutely, low back x-rays if indicated and uh, I find those both to be very helpful. Uh, the next one's a comment. Um, I don't want you to read comments. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm just joking, go ahead. As long as there's nothing nasty, go ahead. Let's see, uh, an older man here with the Beamer B pad wrapped around my arthritic knee as I listen to the webinar. <laughs> I like those kind of comments. So we've got a, a, uh, an, an old RN. I, I won't, uh, won't ask if that's a 35-year-old or a 80-year-old RN, but listening with the Beamer wrapped around their knee. So yeah, it's, it's a great tool to use. And then uh, one final question. Do you treat any patients without adjusting them? Absolutely. Uh, do we treat any patients without adjusting them? I do. So I apologize if that's 
like chiropractic uh, heresy, um, but we do get patients where they don't have any lumbar involvement, where it's, let's say they slipped on the ice 40 years ago and uh, they had arthroscopic surgery in the 70s and their knee has slowly and steady been bothering them ever since. Well, that's, that's a pure, what I call pure orthopedic knee issue. Can I help that person? Yes, um, but do I have the clinical indicators to adjust them? In some cases, not. So, <clears throat> so in any case, do we treat people without adjusting? Absolutely. And make sure that when you're adjusting them, you have this is where you have to be careful. This is why decompression sometimes can be a cleaner and easier option. Because if you're adjusting them and they're a Medicare beneficiary and they don't meet Medicare's, because again, Medicare could care less about your philosophy of knee pain or your philosophy of chiropractic. If they don't meet the Medicare definition of when chiropractic should be utilized, then you can't bill it to Medicare. And then you have to have them sign the ABN, and then you start raising questions. Well, when I saw the chiropractor last year, Medicare paid for it. And honestly, it just, to me, raises more confusion sometimes than it's worth. So I will typically, if it is an asymptomatic low back, but there is neurologic involvement, will typically lean more towards decompression. There's a really great decompression uh, table out there called the back on track. And the back on track is perfect for these patients where you want a gentler, um, it's got kind of a less footprint, so it's not as huge as some of the tables like I showed the picture of. In back on track, you can do a gentler type of traction. Andy Barlow that I mentioned to you before, that's actually what he uses and what he recommends. So, so in any case, we don't adjust everybody, but Medicare is the boogeyman that you do have to um, kind of think about if you're going to bring adjusting into the mix with these folks. So, all right, well, let's jump into marketing here. So that's the, uh, that's the engine that drives the ship. I had one of my uh, practice mentors said to me a few years ago that there are very few problems in practice that more new patients can't solve. Now, of course, I understand bringing new patients into a leaky bucket you're going to frustrate yourself, but I can tell you that a doctor that maybe needs to work on some of their internal systems, and we all do to some degree, but that has a huge funnel bringing new patients in, is going to do a lot better than a doctor who's got everything just jam up and perfected internally, but they're not getting any new patients. So I know a lot of you that are on the call, this is what you're on for is uh, new patients and new patient marketing. Now, I shared with you before the numbers that we see, and that's not to brag, by the way, because there are some of you who are doing far more than that, and I can tell you right now that I'm not this you know, special genius that has any unique qualities that any of you don't. I just know that um, I've been around a lot of really smart people and learned a lot of really effective things, and I'm a good listener, and I'm a good student, and I'm good at assimilating and putting together information. And so that's where these, what I call my three marketing pillars, that's where they came from. Now, number one marketing pillar is newspaper ads. So newspaper ads, it's interesting because you'll hear from people, ah, oh, newspaper doesn't pull, newspaper's dead, newspaper doesn't work anymore, newspaper's going out of business. All right, so let's talk about this. If you are marketing to, you know, 18 to 35-year-olds, then you're right. Don't advertise in the newspaper. If you're running newspaper ads for, you know, here's my picture in a tie and a white coat, and here's my chiropractic clinic, and here's a laundry list of conditions we treat, and now accepting new patients for a $20 exam and x-ray special, you're right, newspaper doesn't work. Niche marketing, which is what I teach and it's what I do, I don't do branding, I do direct response. This means call now for a purpose, to sign up for a consultation, to schedule an appointment, um, to attend one of our seminars. For that type of a market, newspaper is not dead. Consider your demographic. The chronic knee pain patients you're going after, this demographic is going to be the 55 to 80 demographic. Those people, they read the paper. Those people, they read the paper cover to cover. And so, when you're marketing for a specific condition with good proven marketing, because some of you are going to finish this webinar and you're going to go, all right, got it. I got the knee pain thing down. I'm going to go write my own ads and I'm going to go test my own stuff and I'm going to run it. God bless you. That's, that's awesome. But that is a very, very expensive proposition. 
you say expensive. No, no, I'm saving money. I'm, I'm not buying ads from you know these marketing groups or practice management groups or you know Dr. Walker or someone like you. No, no, that's the most expensive way to do it because you're taking something that's unproven. You're having to test it. You have to test different headlines, different pictures, uh, different ad placements, sizes, colors, etc. With someone that uh, is a member of my program, the testing's kind of already done for you because we already know what works. We already know what gets results. And that's the beautiful thing about the newspaper is we've proven this and it's been proven time and time again across the country. So now just a couple of things for you to keep in mind. Uh, placement on page A3, if you can get it, that's the best. Um, now the cool thing with the senior demographic is because they read the whole paper, placement is not quite as critical. But if you're going to negotiate, negotiate on price and price and price and price, but then when you, they won't go down any further on price, now you negotiate on other terms, placement being one of those. So I've tested this, and if you can get page A3, that's where we've had great success. I've also had doctors that they like the back page. If you can get on the page that the weather is on, sometimes you can get a half page on the weather page. Seniors like to check the weather. They check it almost every day. Sundays are going to be your day with highest circulation. So in my office, we started off running ads just on Sundays, and now we run them on Sundays and on Wednesdays. So I typically run two half-page newspaper ads a week. Sundays have the highest circulation. Uh, people tend to read the paper more thoroughly on Sundays because it's kind of a kickback. You know, they're either it's after church or it's you know Sunday fun day, and they're just kind of kicking back and relaxing for the day. So unless it is insanely more expensive to run on a Sunday, then that's where I'd recommend you're going to get the best bang for your buck. I would also recommend that you look at the main newspaper of circulation in your area. What do I mean by that? There's a reason that running in the free weekly papers and running in the neighborhood papers and uh, running in the coupon clippers, and there's a reason that they're cheap to advertise in because it doesn't work. The, it's funny, the Houston Chronicle, Lord knows when that picture was taken. I think the Houston Chronicle is still around. Um, there's a reason why it's expensive or more expensive to advertise in those papers. It's because it works. So you don't look at the cost of it. Expensive is a relative term. You know, well, that costs $1,000. Gee, that's expensive. Well, no, if it's that Ferrari I showed you in the picture earlier, then that's actually really cheap. If it's the, you know, big pen that's sitting on my desk in front of me right now, then, yeah, that's expensive. So we don't make choices based on cost. We make choices based on value. And so price is only a consideration in the absence of value. And when you're talking about your newspaper marketing, this is where you get the best bang for your buck. Now, if you're, some of you are sitting on here going, well, yeah, 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 you're in Podunkville, Ocala, Florida, you know, population, you know, 75,000, but I'm in uh, downtown Manhattan, or I'm smack in the middle of Denver, Colorado, and it costs 10 grand to run a half page in our paper. Okay, I get that. And you're going to get calls from all over creation, and it's probably not what you're looking to do. If you're in a market where the cost of running a half page is just prohibitively expensive, then targeted inserts, eight and a half by 11 targeted inserts. And so this is where we put some, some of these together for you and basically turn the ads into eight and a half by 11 inserts. So you can geo-target a radius of your practice, spend a thousand, fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars, something like that, and target that, uh, that radius around your practice and you're hitting the people that you want to be hitting anyway. So newspaper, that is the number one of the three pillars. Uh, we talked about testing, testing color, black and white, and then with all of your marketing, answering service, doctors, it drives me bananas when I try and call some of you or I call the personal injury lawyers that I work with or I call, um, what was it I needed the other day? I forget, something for our house and it was some kind of a service professional that I called and I can't stand voicemail and phone trees and please, 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 doctors, if you're going to spend money on marketing, if you're going to be marketing to your existing patient base, if you're going to market to personal injury lawyers, if you're going to do anything, get an answering service to handle the calls. What we do is I use a service called Answer Force. It's the best answering service I've ever used. They have a very, very sophisticated onboarding process. So you tell them exactly how you want the phones answered, how you want the calls triaged. We have it set up to when someone calls after hours, if it is a new patient calling to make an appointment, if it is a lawyer's office or a doctor's office, 
they ring them to my cell phone. So here's what happens. It call, I get a call that says, Dr. Walker, this is Tim with your service. I have Mrs. So-and-so on the line from you know, so-and-so law firm. And I'll say, go ahead, go ahead and put them through. Or if they call and I'm you know, in church or I'm you know, at my kid's school at the Christmas play or something like that, I just don't pick up. And they say, well, Mrs. Smith, we attempted to reach Dr. Walker, weren't able to reach him. Um, you know, may I take a message and we'll have someone from the office, we'll call you on Monday or we'll call you tomorrow morning or whatever the case. As this very evening, as I was sitting in my office, uh, or sitting in my home office, I got a call at about 5.30, and so my, uh, my office closes at 5 on Tuesdays. We close earlier on Tuesdays than any other day of the week, and I get a call at about 5.30 from an attorney's office that wants to send a new patient my way. And fortunately, this is an attorney we know and get a lot of referrals from, but what if it wasn't? What if it was an attorney that found us on a Google search because they're out of town? What if it was an attorney who, that patient needs to be seen tomorrow first thing, and they're just making calls so they get someone? Doctors, you have no clue how much business you've lost because of your answering machine. It's just unbelievable to me. I have lawyer buddies, and I've got one in particular. I jump on him all the time because I know he spends a lot of money on his uh, website and Internet marketing. And I tell him his name's Ron, and I say, Ron, do you realize how many calls you're losing? I said, I know for a fact you're willing to take, you know, cell phone calls and they forward, you know, during certain times forward the office calls to his cell phone. It's not like he's too good for it. Lawyers are the king of taking calls 24-7, but people just overlook this stuff. So please, please, please don't do that. So Answerforce.com uh, is who I recommend. All right, second marketing pillar is radio. Now, radio ads, I run two types of radio. I run direct response radio ads, this is call for an offer, and we run radio to promote our third pillar we'll discuss, hint, hint, seminars. So radio, I'm gonna drop a gold nugget on you guys. If you do nothing with my program, I want you to leave thinking that you got a ton of value here tonight. Radio ads, talk radio, and Dr. Bremhall's gonna love this. Conservative talk radio is by far and away the best format. And I don't mean the best format like whether you agree with what they say or not. I don't care where you are on the political spectrum. This isn't a political value statement. This is a marketing value statement. Conservative talk radio, we've split tested. We've split it against the oldie station, against the Christian station, against the country station. Talk radio does the best. Why? Because it tends to attract, and Dr. Brimhall will love this, tends to attract a higher educated, tends to attract a higher income uh, type of a demographic. It certainly attracts an older demographic compared to like country or top 40 or things like that. And you're looking for older. But more importantly, it is an attentive demographic. Here's what I mean. When you're listening to the Christian station, the country station, the oldie station, it's just kind of on sometimes. You know, I have a, a Christian music station playing in my waiting room, and there's times where I'm in the car with my wife and a song will come on the radio, and I'm like halfway singing along to it. I'm going, how do I know that? I don't think I've heard this song. Well, if it's been on in the background of my office, and I like subconsciously know the song, which is kind of crazy. Whereas with talk radio, when someone's listening to a uh, talk radio show program, they're actually listening because that's why they tuned in was to hear what this person's saying. So when the commercials come on, guess what? They're still in attentive mode. And so the response rate is dramatically higher. So that's your golden nugget. So many doctors I find are unwilling for whatever reason to test radio. It's not that expensive. Um, it's not like TV where you've got to spend, you know, three, four, or five hundred dollars a spot. Um, Talk radio, in my opinion, is a great value, and I love the patients that come in, particularly if you happen to be more conservative politically. You already know they agree with you, and my number one rule is I don't talk religion or politics with patients unless I know they agree with me, and if they agree with me, then I can, you know, Mrs. Jones, you know, with what's happening with Medicare and with the federal government, and the decision you've got to make is whether uh, you want to let the government be in charge of your health care or whether you're ready to take some responsibility and take some action on your own. You know if they were listening to right-wing talk radio that that's a statement that, you know, they don't want the government to have to be in charge of anything. But some of them, they don't connect that with, well, you know, Medicare has got to take care of me. So anyway, that's a phenomenal tool. And as I said, you use this for direct response. So we have direct response knee radio ads that are included with the Knee Pain Elite program. And we also have ads that promote your knee seminars. So this brings me to the third marketing pillar, which is the seminars.
Now, knee pain seminars, number one, why should you do seminar marketing? Well, there's a lower barrier of entry. <clears throat> People will come to your seminars who won't come to your office to make an appointment, even if it's a free consult. Why? Well, because they think they're going to go to the doctor's office, they're going to have to fill out a ton of paperwork, they're going to have to sit and wait for an hour or two, they're going to have to strip down to their underwear, sit in this paper gown on this crinkly paper table, and the doctor's going to be behind, and he's going to be rushed. That's what they've been indoctrinated is the typical visit. And your office is probably not like that. I hope so. My office is not like that. But most doctor's offices are. Whereas a seminar, they can sit, no one confronts them, no one asks them questions, they can sit in the back, they can feel you out. Um, it's just a much lower barrier of entry for people to come. You'll get, I, I can almost guarantee, anywhere in the country, if you run a direct response ad versus a seminar ad, you're almost always going to get higher call volume and higher signups for a seminar than you will for direct response. But again, put that to the test. I do knee pain seminars on uh, just about a monthly basis, and we just did one this past week. I had uh, 51 patients at the knee pain seminar, uh, 51 people there, and we signed up 25 new patients. And so the beauty of it is most of those people come with a spouse. So you know, to think, oh, I only got half the people to come. Well, I got almost every eligible person to come in and some spouses, because guess what? One of my little seminar hacks that I figured out about six months ago was to make sure that I mentioned neuropathy at the seminar and to make sure I mentioned low back pain at the seminar. And I even throw in car accidents and sprinkle that in just a little bit uh, when I'm explaining, because in my seminar I'll show them a digital motion x-ray. Most of you won't do that because you don't use it. From this last seminar that I just did, the one this past Saturday, of course I picked up a bunch of knee pain patients, but yesterday, I saw a car accident patient from the seminar, seven-day-old auto accident that hadn't been to any doctors. Pretty cool. Uh, that paid for the, the seminar promotions and cost several times over. Uh, today, I saw a patient's spouse who came in with neuropathy. And so make sure, doctors, that you mention in a credible way. I explained it in this way. So there's three chronic conditions we specialize in, chronic knee pain, neuropathy, which means numbness, tingling, burning, pain in the feet or sometimes the hands, and then chronic low back pain, bulging discs, arthritis, degenerative discs, and I'll tell them, can you guess why I specialize in those three? Because they all work together. I joke and I'll say there's an old song you may have heard of, the hip bones connect to the knee bone, and people laugh but they get it. I say you, you can understand how your knees could be a problem if you've got these issues in your lower back or these problems with your feet and they're not functioning right, can't you see how that puts more stress on the knees? So I've seen my signups go up uh, by probably about 10 or 15 percent by making sure I add in those other conditions and you pick up patients that you wouldn't always pick up. Also doctors make sure when you're in the office you do the same thing, meaning they come in for knee pain. Well Mrs. Jones, we find that people that have these types of knee issues other joints, especially the ones right above it and below it, can be affected. How's your low back doing? Um, any issues with your feet at all? And you'd be amazed the stuff that you'll pick up that people just don't, they came for the knees. They don't think about the rest. I also like doing these seminars uh, because they are a pre-visit report of findings. We will average, typical seminar for us is about 40 to 60 people. I've had as much as 110 for a neuropathy seminar. Uh, we had 100 for a knee pain seminar that we did earlier this, uh, or this year, back in April, I think it was. But typical for us is right around 50 or so. And so for those 50 people, uh, that's a pre-visit report of findings. So when they come to the office, they're already educated. They already like you. They know you. They trust you. They think you're an authority figure. That's a good thing. So we find that uh, getting folks to start with care that have already attended a seminar, as you might expect, is a little bit easier proposition. So lastly, some of you are wondering, where do I host these things? Uh, this is, looks like the Four Seasons Ballroom or something. and We don't do that, but if you have a waiting room, which most of us don't, big enough where you can hold 20, 30, 40, 50 people, then do it at your office. Um, or if you're more comfortable speaking to a smaller group, there are some doctors that will do multiple seminars. They'll do one a week, but they'll cap it at 15 people or 20 people. And there's advantages to that because you get a different dynamic and rapport with a smaller group. 
I'm busy, I like to travel, I've got stuff with my family, seminars, speaking engagements, things like that. So for me, I'd rather do one big seminar a month, and we'll typically do one on neuropathy and one on knee pain each month, than to do a bunch of little ones. But again, that's just me. So where do you host these? I like doing them at a kind of mid-level hotel. Hampton and Homewood uh, are my two sort of sweet spots. Because if you do them at like a Hilton or a Marriott or those types of places, uh, they require you, if you're going to do dinner and you're, or you're going to do lunch or any type of a meal, you got to use their caterers, and it costs an arm and a leg. Uh, what I like is to do them at a Hampton because I can bring in my own food and I can bring in my own meals. And so another little kind of insider secret, because I've split test to this, Saturdays from 11 to 12, that's when we found the best time and the best turnout. Because with the seniors, they don't have soccer games and football practice and dance recitals and stuff on the weekend like you know those of us with kids do they have doctor appointments during the week and this time of year when it's in the winter months they don't like to drive you know, after dark and so doing an evening seminar can be problematic so Saturdays from 11 to 12 we serve lunch afterwards the whole event I might spend if I do one newspaper ad that costs me about 750 bucks I'll do a week of radio to promote it that costs me about like six to seven hundred bucks so I'm like fifteen hundred dollars in there uh, the cost of the hotel and the food is going to run maybe call it another four to five hundred dollars between renting the space and the hotel and the food. So I'm at about two grand, let's call it, for the whole enchilada. Two grand. Typical case fee on a knee pain patient, and this is for our doctors across the country, typically runs anywhere from about three to five thousand. Probably four to forty five hundred is kind of my average. So you know, they've got that. You hear that? Oh, well, one patient pays for it. Well, no, it really is true with this. If you have 50 people attend your seminar, you sign up 25 new patients, and let's say of those, you sign up um, 40 or 50 percent of them actually, you know, start on some kind of a care plan. Then those are pretty good numbers for you know, showing up to speak for an hour at a hotel on a Saturday. So seminar marketing, I really love it. But those of you that have been around me for five minutes know I like to talk. So if you don't, then don't do seminars, just do radio and do newspaper, and you'll still get great results with those. But seminar marketing is really um, something I enjoy, and, and for me it's a lot of fun. Uh, we talked about what day is best, so we already covered that. All right, so let's kind of land the plane here. Um, I want to go through, those of you that are interested in having this whole process turnkeyed for you, you want the ads done for you, you want the scripting, how to do the exam, uh, the treatment strategies, the whole process of doing a seminar with the PowerPoint and the marketing and the scripting and everything, this is what, just like for neuropathy, we put the same thing together for knee pain. Now, same as our neuropathy program, the normal price of the knee pain program is $49.95, which quite frankly is a drop in the bucket for the types of, of new patients that this generates. And you know, he mentioned Dr. Liebman with neuropathy. I'm thrilled to get Jesse uh, up and running with knee pain because he's just going to hit an absolute home run. So the Bremhall special that we're doing, this is my way of, number one, saying thank you to Dr. Bremhall for allowing me to come on, and two, this is my incentive for you to take some massive action because this Bremhall special today is Tuesday and so we're going to run this price through the end of the week because I want some of the folks that couldn't get on because of timing or family, they're going to have to listen to the replay and this is going to run through the end of the week with the Bremhall discount. So you save $1,000 by taking action. Now some of you that are going, well, you know, with this is the end of the year coming up and I'm not sure I want to spend my money, we've broken this down into some extended pay options as well. So if you want to do a six pay, it's a six pay of 732. If you want to break it all the way down to a 12 pay, it's 416. Now your biggest savings is to do the single pay of 3995. However, if you do one of the extended options, we do offer 90 days same as cash. So you're like, man, I want to break this up, but I really want the single price. You run the ads, you do the marketing, you learn this stuff. It takes the average doctor a couple weeks to go through all the videos and the training modules and the program and get up to speed with everything. And you're off to the races. You get a couple patients started on care and the thing pays for itself and you can pay it off within the first 90 days. 
Now to sweeten the pot for those of you that you're like, man, I've, I've been looking for something in the knee pain space and I think this is it, the first five orders. So those of you that are listening to this on a replay, I'm sorry if you call me and you didn't make the cut, but the first five orders, we're going to include an Amazon Kindle Fire loaded with the entire knee pain elite system. So you're going to get the whole enchilada put on a Kindle, which is really cool and really handy because you can kind of have everything in one spot and all together there for you. So now I'm going to do a couple things here. I'm going to put up my phone number, and so this is the direct number. This is my personal cell phone, and just like I give this to the lawyers and I give this to the doctor's offices, I want you guys all to have this. That's 904-616-1284. You can text me with questions. You can call me with questions, or if you're ready to get this rocking and rolling, then I want you to give me a call. Now, what I want to do to close out the webinar here and kind of land the plane is open back up again for questions in the marketing space or if any other clinical questions have come up, I want to open the floor for questions before we close the webinar. All right, there's already three questions in here. Um, the first one is, do you think that doing the rebuilder and the earth wraps alone without lasers would make a good impact on the knee pain alone? I think it would help, but I don't think that it would probably be the massive life changer that people are necessarily looking for. I really think if you're going to get the uh, most effective results, you need to be using either a laser or a PEMF device. That's my personal opinion. Now, if someone isn't paying a you know big case fee and all you're doing is earth wraps and rebuilder, well, then they have a different level of expectation, and so you're better off than doing nothing. But if you really want to get into this and get serious about it, then I think that you're probably selling yourself and the patient short a bit by just doing the earth wraps and the rebuilder. Let me climb in here just a little bit. I've been doing laser since 1972, and you'd have to cut my arms off to keep me from using one. I mean, if you're going to be a chiropractor, you're a naturopath, you're a massage therapist, I mean, how do you get by without a laser? I can't even understand the question. Uh, there's some as inexpensive as $3,000. You call Jason, we'll even give you a special on it. Uh, that, at my office, is you can go to www.brimhall.com, that's pretty hard, or 480-964-5198. Just go to brimhall.com, that will show up for you. But the best one I use is Class 4, like he talks about. Normally, they can be, those could be twenty to 30000 But we use one that's the most powerful coal laser. It's 6.1 watts of laser. And because it's a cold laser, it doesn't burn. As long as you keep it moving, you can get incredible research because all the energy goes right into the tissue. And it's only 13,000. And I mean only 13,000. Because by the time you've done two or three cases with this, you've more than paid for it. It's going to last you another 10 years. I've had mine for, I don't know, two or three, and I haven't even had a hiccup on it. So, But if you really tight with money, then just get the, the quantum laser Jason has for you. It's only three grand. And you will make that pay all day long. I mean, I don't know, again, how you would treat without it. We use it for migraines, we use it for neck pain, we use it for knee pain, we use it for inflammation, we use it for irritation, we use it for acupuncture points. All right, that's my two cents. Thanks for thanks for jumping in, Doc. All right, uh, next one would be, do you adjust the knee itself along with the other therapies? Great question. So uh, what we will actually do, and I, I didn't discuss this because I didn't want to kind of muddy the waters and confuse things, but we actually use a, a hands-on technique called Trigenics. And some of you have heard of Trigenics before. Um, it's a pretty lengthy and, and pretty uh, extensive training process to get certified in Trigenics. But yes, that is something that we will address the knee with a hands-on type of fashion. And particularly if that's something that you feel really confident and really comfortable with, you're a really good extremity adjuster, then I absolutely would recommend adjusting the knee as well. But I want to pipe in here too. You guys need to make it the homecoming. We're going to be having hands-on to show you how to treat extremities and special needs. Now we use instrument adjustment and we use the percussor. And you can unwind a knee that has never been helped for. And you can also do a jaw too, because knee pain, hip pain can come from even jaw. So we'll teach you how to do a, a jaw, a knee, a hip, a spine, foot, an ankle. And uh, with the percussor, you can do all of that and have no chance of hurting the patient. So there's so many things you can learn from homecoming. And then the final one is how many sessions per week are you having patients come in on average? 
so typically the way that I'll frame it to a patient is, Mrs. Jones, we're going to do a trial course of care of uh, three sessions weekly for five weeks is about our average. And what I can tell you, Mrs. Jones, is about 80 to 85 percent of our patients are showing significant progress and improvement at that five-week point. If that's the case, we're going to continue on for another five weeks. That's particularly important with the regeneration of that damaged cartilage that we talked about. If we're not showing results at the halfway point, then you and I are going to sit down and go back to the drawing board and discuss any other options, anything else we might need to be doing differently, and then go from there. And so what that does is that avoids any issues with patient going through 30 sessions and at the end of it, because we've all had this, we've all paid the stupid tax here, and the patient looks at you and says, well, my knee doesn't feel any better. Doc, what's the, what's the deal? And that's really frustrating. That's where they want refunds. That's where board complaints come in. That's where bad Google and Yelp reviews come in. And so when they get to the halfway point, if it's not helping, the patient, they don't get mad at you. I've literally had them say, well, Dr. Walker, you know, I know, boy, you guys just tried so hard, and I, your staff was just great with these, these therapies, and Dr. Fontaine was, I was just awesome. I, you know, I just probably waited too long, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just really, I'm sorry that, you know, this couldn't help me. And that's it. We had one lady who, after I discharged her at the halfway point, this was a neuropathy patient, because she wasn't getting results, she brought lunch into the office the next day. So she'd spent half of a case fee with us because we, of course, refund them back the other uh, half of their case fee if they don't get results. So she'd spent $2,000, $2,500 with us but was so happy with the integrity and the way we handled things that she brought in lunch the next day for my staff. So that's how I handle it. So the whole treatment as a whole would be typically three times a week for, let's just say, eight to ten weeks is kind of a range. That's all the questions. All right. So, doctors, I don't have uh, anything else to throw at you today. Um, if you want to give me a call, it's, uh, let's see here, just after 10 o'clock on the East Coast, so I will be awake for probably another hour or so. Uh, if you want to give me a call, then you've got the number. Remember, the first five doctors that join on get the Kindle Fire bonus, and then through the end of the week, you'll be able to take advantage of the Grim Hall Special with that $1,000 savings and we do have those extended pay options I mentioned. So let me just kind of wrap up by saying thank you, Dr. Bremhall, so much for having me on and the opportunity to share this with your doctors. And I am pumped to uh, come hang out with everyone at homecoming and have a great time out there. Thanks for being here, and thank all you for joining us. We will go ahead and email this out so you'll have it available. For some reason you're not getting the puzzle pieces, then just uh, call Jason while I'll get your name there. We'll see that you have it for future reference. Thank you, Dr. Walker. Thank you so much.